Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we have also some colleagues from the European Parliament with us today. Um, it is such a pleasure to welcome you here at the first EIF event after the summer break in person and online at this great venue at the heart of European Quarter in Brussels. Today, my co-host, MEP Axel Voss, and I together with the EIF invite you all to discuss the important topic of artificial intelligence with our distinguished speakers. The European Commission's proposal for an Artificial Intelligence Act is being discussed in the European institutions and will mark the first legislation of its kind in the world. We are trying to foster pursuing of trustworthy AI by design and to prevent the rules from stifling innovation and hindering the creation of a flourishing AI ecosystem in Europe. The use of artificial intelligence in the cultural and creative industries is helping companies improve their services and enhance the consumer experience. AI applications are increasingly helpful to improve editing and production processes are the next step in video game development. Save resources for special effects and enhance the cur uh, curation and recommendation of an ever-growing volume of diverse creative content. Can we ensure that risk-based approach is followed in order uh, to foster the uptake of the technologies in the sector? How can we ensure a balanced level of transparency to enhance knowledge and understanding for users? These questions shall provide the broader framework of our discussion now, for which we are able to win a great expertise. Let me introduce now our speakers of today. A warm welcome to Elma Nubemeyer, Director of Product Innovation and Product Management at Netflix. Uh, an equal warm welcome to Anne Becker. She is Head of Policy and Public Affairs at the Interactive Software Federation of Europe. I want to welcome Christian Fock. He is Chief Data Officer at SRG, SSS, Public Service Media Broadcasters, and is joining us as well today. And to cover the perspective of the European Commission, we welcome Kilian Gross, uh, Head of Unit for Artificial Intelligence Policy Development and Coordination at the DG Connect uh, with the European Commission. I would like to give the floor now first to Elma Nobemeyer, please. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for um, having me here and um, enabling me to talk to everyone. Um, uh, today, members and users all over the world, both at Netflix and other services, have access to more content than ever, and they have more choice to experience great stories from all over the world uh, than ever before. It's an exciting time to be a consumer um, of digital and audiovisual media. At Netflix, my role is um, to help build a recommendation system that helps members to discover the type of content they love. And that's really what we are focused on. Um, we have two, more than 220 million members from all over the world, and we want to provide great recommendations to each and every one of them. And that's where really we rely on AI to provide a great product experience. And member tastes are very diverse. Even when I look at my own uh, viewing history, there are all sorts of different formats from different countries in there. For example, uh, the series Dark, which being German, I absolutely loved. Um, there is a movie I watched called 14 Peaks about a Nepalese mountain climber. And of course, our big hit show La Casa de Papel from Spain. Really, when we want to recommend great shows to everyone, uh, the most important and powerful data that we can use is what a member has watched and what members like them have watched. That is really what's driving the power of recommendations at Netflix. And this kind of data, it all is based on engagement on Netflix itself. And we don't have to ask our members for demographic data, for example, like age or gender, which is a much less useful tool when it comes to predicting what somebody actually likes. Um, knowing what you've actually watched is much more powerful. We also want to make sure that recommendations are always useful for members and help them explore 
other aspects of our catalog and expand their taste over time. So we consciously inject some diversity and even randomness into our recommendations to make sure that um, we never lock in someone into their tastes based on what they've watched in the past. And we do this at really large scale. Um, when you think about titles that we've launched this year, more than 95% of them were shown and recommended to more than a million members. For European content, we've had absolutely amazing successes um, over, the, over the years. And in fact, we recommend European content billions of times every month. Um, just to give you one example, we launched a title, um, a movie from France called Restless, and it has been recommended in more than 200 countries from all over the world. And 91% 90, of members in France got a recommendation for this title. And 75% of members outside of France. So we really promote um, and recommend European content all over the world because people love it. We also put a lot of effort into the discoverability of European content um, and content in general. Um, one thing that we do, for example, is provide very specific rows and collections that feature European content, and those can be very specific. So as an example, we have a row called Romantic European Movies Based on Classic Literature. So it goes really deep, but at the same time, um, it's all really in the service of members. So we also show European content next to non-European content, if that's a helpful way of organizing our catalog. And members can always find other content and explore in search, um, or um, we make them aware through our messaging system. I should also say, um, because this may be helpful for everyone, to tell you what we don't use AI for. Um, we never rely on AI to make decisions about um, which content to buy or um, to use AI to create um, content from the ground up. Um, those, both of these decisions, which content to buy and how to actually create content, are deeply human decisions that are very complex and don't lend themselves well to the application of AI. We do use AI in those decisions as helpful tools to predict demand, for example, um, or to make our content look even better. Um, as one example, when we produced um, the Martin Scorsese movie, The Irishman, we relied on AI technology to let uh, Robert De Niro uh, play a character between the ages of 24 and 76. And um, those um, advances wouldn't have been possible without the use of AI or would have looked um, quite terrible for, for our consumers. Um, so we're excited about the possibilities about, uh, of these technologies, um, but we can never and never want to take the human out of the loop um, it's really important in order to create great content to have great um, human decision making involved. Lastly, um, just to close, um, I just want to emphasize our business really th uh, thrives if we make our members happy. Uh, they can cancel any time, so we're always on the hook for providing a great experience and recommendations and AI are useful tools for us to enable that. Um, but we also really need to make the product experience intuitive so that members um, can find their way around. That's, that's why we have um, also unpersonalized rows like top 10 where members just learn about what's popular in the country um, as well as functionality like search. We also offer a lot of user controls. Uh, members can download all their data, um, their whole watch history. They can eliminate uh, titles from their watch history so they don't get considered in their future recommendations, um, which is important um, for us to provide uh, that level of control. With that, I'm at the end. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. And now our next speaker is Ann Becker. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to EIF for organizing the debate today. And I would also like to thank uh, uh, Mrs. Fahayan and Mr. Voss, because it is important, I think, that members of the European Parliament, you, you are also aware of uh, how AI is used in the creative sectors, uh, and also 
we will also discuss a little bit about the proposal, how it also affects the creative sector. So my name is Anne, I'm Head of po uh, Public Policy uh, at ICFE. So ICFE represents the European video game sector. We have members that are in, uh, in form of national trade associations across Europe, and we also have the major European and international uh, video game companies in our membership. Uh, just a little bit about the, the sector. We just released our annual uh, key facts, uh, the 2021 year on year, and uh, there are about 90, 98,000 people working in the video game sector in Europe today. Uh, it's a 14% growth from previous years, and uh, we have a turnover in Europe for about 23.3 billion euros. So that's a little bit about uh, about. Uh, uh, the sector in, in Europe. So I'd like to speak a little bit about how AI is used in video games and perhaps mention a couple of points uh, in the proposal uh, that are important for our sector. Uh, so AI in video games has simply been used for decades. Uh, as an example, you have it in content creation. Many video games, they rely on very large open virtual worlds and that provides uh, the virtual worlds for the players to experience. And creating such large virtual worlds that demands a lot of effort uh, and today with the massive multiplayer online environments, that is extremely difficult to do that without AI generated content. Uh, and uh, the tool of AI in terms of generating content that will help the artists in the video game, uh, in the video game development, it will help the creative directors uh, to focus on narratives and other creative aspects of the, of the content creation, that is really key. And more, more recently, AI systems, they can even be used, for instance, to manage, for example, environment effects in a video game, such as weather and lightning in the open world uh, games. Uh, it's also used to improve animation quality by the use of uh, motion and facial capture uh, to put an actor's performance into the game. Uh, and now I think we've seen hundreds of games that have been using these techniques. We also see this in the audiovisual sector, for instance. Uh, and that can help, help to create more realistic animations within games and give a lifelike quality to the character animation. So as a third point, uh, AI is also used to choose behavior for con computer-controlled opponents within a game. So that is an AI control that apply to any automated entity within a game. So it can be a direct opponent in a chess game. Uh, it can be a, multi a multiple non-player character in a game. Uh, it can be such as a football simulator or in a racing game. So that automated player opponent part has, has been part of, of the video game sector for a very long time. Uh, so, and, and without this way to developing a way for a game to play intelligently uh, against a single user, uh, our, our sector uh, would not simply be the success uh, that it is. So it's really, it's really crucial. Uh, these types of AI, they do not learn or adopt new behaviors uh, beyond what they're programmed to do. So in fact, their possible behavior already established and programmed uh, before the player plays the game. Uh, so that was a little bit for the creative purposes. So AI is a really, really important tool uh, in order to have uh, video game creative experiences uh, and to ensure that we continue to innovate in the space. Uh, then, of course, AI is also used in, uh, in the non-creative and the non-interactive aspects of a game. Uh, that can be to provide player support, uh, to tools to direct any cheating in the game, if that would occur, uh, and also about player safety in, in chats using AI tool for uh, moderation, for example. Uh, and perhaps just a little bit why, why we are interested in the AI proposal. Uh, I think we really welcome the risk-based approach put forward by the European Commission. Uh, 
it's focusing on the high risk with limited obligations imposed on users that are not high risks. And I think the Commission was also quite clear uh, with the proposal that it would not apply to AI users that poses no risk. Uh, a couple of points, however, uh, that are important for, for our sector. That is, of course, that the definition uh, is aligned with other international definitions and that Europe does not evolve entirely in a, in, a, in a closed system there. So we would welcome very much alignment with the OECD definition. That would also provide further clarity to developers uh, and businesses. Uh, otherwise, it, it may become conf uh, a bit complex to have different definitions, especially when you operate on a global scale. Um, and then we, of course, have uh, a little bit around transparency obligations for AI users that are not high risk in the so-called Article 52 uh, of the proposal for an AI Act. Uh, and that is important because clarity is important for businesses, it's important for small developers, it's also important for larger uh, video game companies and for any creative sectors that use computer-generated imagery to, to understand a little bit uh, w what would apply. And uh, I think here what was put forward in the Commission proposal, uh, the specific reference to freedom of expression and the right to the freedom of arts, uh, it's absolutely crucial for our sector and I would believe for other creative sector that that is safeguarded. Uh, we do understand it's very important to deal with things like deep fakes and the impact that that may have on democracy. Uh, but it's equally important uh, for those industries that use the AI-generated imagery to just be very certain that they would not fall under a deep fake definition, for instance, because that would then entail obligations. So with this, uh, I will uh, stop, and I'm looking forward to the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne Becker. Now the next uh, speaker on our today's event is Christian Fock. Please, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here on behalf of the public service media, I have a journalistic background, but I'm working since many years in data and in strategy, so I, I know quite both of the sides of the business. My role today is to give you an insight uh, in our daily business connected to AI, and um, this media business is uh, completely data-driven today, which is a no-brainer, I must say, so let's dive into some details. Um, for a better understanding, I'd like to divide the use of AI applications in, in four categories. So generating metadata is the first one, research for information and content, production of media assets, and the user-centered view. But in the end, these categories are more or less uh, closely intertwined. And believe me, there are hundreds of tools and applications already on the market to be used in the context of media. For example, for recommendation purposes, you need not only usage data, as uh, Elmer just pointed out, uh, I'm sure they use also the content data, the metadata of videos, audios, pictures, sound, etc. Another use case, in order to find content quickly and precisely, for example, in a huge archive, we need descriptive data, metadata. And the dream of every producer or myself as a journalist is uh, when we're desperately looking, searching for very specific content in the archive, who talks about what and when? And this at the push of a button, now immediately, quickly. Today, state-of-the-art AI-driven tools enable us to analyze video and audio for its entire content within a very, very short time. Protagonists, locations, accessoires, but also mood, emotions, and of course, all spoken text. Everything can be evalu evaluated for further actions. Then. AI helps us in this context enormously. For example, automatic transcription of audio and video. Imagine a radio reporter, I used to start as a ra radio reporter, by the way, records half an hour an interview. Until now, he had to transcribe it more or less tediously 
in order to be able to process it further. Today, he runs it through a speech-to-text tool and has the text up to five times faster than real time. So to speak, the 30 minutes interview in five to six minutes with the help of AI. For example, we have also managed in uh, Switzerland to have a tool that even transcribes the Swiss-German dialects, which are quite complicated. And, but this is the important learning with this. Such texts are not error-free, and our journalists know that, and they can handle that responsibly. In this context, we also are working with automatic subtitling, a service that is almost expected as a matter of course in the digital world today, especially from public service broadcasting, which is committed to accessibility. And speaking of accessibility, we have also created avatars, so video deep fakes of real TV presenters. Yeah, they exist. We can put any audio into their mouths, which they present lip synced, full body motion, it's somehow amazing. We use these avatars to highlight the dangers of fake realities in schools, and we will use this technology for sign language interpretation. But at the same time, we made it very clear through our ethical guidelines, these avatars will not be used in a journalistic environment, because that could obviously undermine our credibility. And this example shows, in my view, the balancing act of AI in the media sector. What is not a problem in fictional film and gaming, as we just heard, would be very controversial in news journalism. The creation of metadata and the search for content, they do overlap. We use facial recognition, object and scene recognition, even voice profiles of famous people, politicians, actors, and so on. We have it all. All of this serves to optimize and, let's be honest, also to compress our workflows. Because producing more and more content for more and more playout channels with the same or fewer resources, it's a sort of a Herculean task. However, there's one thing we attach great importance to. For example, recognition of faces or voices. We have built up our own databases which every in which every new entry is checked by specialists, human specialists. This is very important for us. And we have given ourselves internal rules, guidelines about what we use such technologies for and what we don't use them for. For example, facial recognition would still produce hits in a crowd if a stored profile came up, but we are not the police. So such a search is out of the question for us. Or, and now we sneak, uh, we sneak into the production category. For example, we use AI to summarize texts. But none of these machine-generated texts are published without editorial review. Because we know this AI sometimes hallucinates. You didn't know that? Yeah, it's real. And when we, for example, mix recommended news, we use a public service algorithm to mix in certain items, for example, news, in order to avoid bubbles. Some more? Okay. AI helps us to expose fakes. It supports so-called highlight clipping within sports, for example. We can automatically find the best images with the help of an aesthetic score. Netflix has the best one on the market, but they don't share it. <laughs> and we create artificial voices uh, that sound real and thus also replace hum humans. Yeah, we do that. But here comes the self-restriction again. We refrain from cloning voices for legal and credibility reasons, and we only replace human voices if they were not previously known by name by the audience. Think about, for example, about the navigation device in your car and its artificial created voice. You don't know the name. Maybe you name it. But <laughs> to sum it all up, um, AI has become really indispensable in the, mod in the modern media world. And in our view, the advantages clearly outweigh the disadvantages, that's a fact. But it's just as important to know the disadvantages and to train all those who work with AI tools behind the scenes accordingly and towards the audience, our customer, so to speak, we clearly foc on, focus on responsibility. This means that we point out the use of AI in certain cases and that we act according to our ethical guidelines. These put people and our public service mission in the center. And uh, having said all this and more on the, on the policy uh, speaking now, I think AI needs, of course, appropriate regulatory um, guarding rails, but adapted to the real business. 
and the existing risk, they are they, they must be reflected, but we need room to maneuver for our responsible media activities. So I hope we find in the discussion the right balance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fock. And now, last but not least, uh, Kilian Gross from the Commission, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot, Mr. Hoy and, and uh, Mr. Foss, for the invitation. It's very nice to be back after the summer break, and it's good to have nice events uh, when you start to work, uh, because otherwise it always feels a bit depressing after um, a nice August. I have an unpleasant task because I'm here the bureaucrat. I have to, uh, after all these fantastic films and movies and applications which you have heard, I come now with the rules, so I feel a bit like the teacher, telling you uh, all these uh, ladies and gentlemen have told you what's possible and I will tell you what's forbidden. <coughs> <laughs> but the good news I have is uh, that the AI Act which we have proposed is not in the first place about forbidding anything or limiting it. It's an internal market legislation. And this, I think, is very important to stress from the beginning. What we want, and we are DG Connect, so we are there to, to build up a digital economy. We want uh, an AI which flourishes in Europe, and we want one set of guiding principles and rules for all the 27 members, because we think it's much better to have one set of rules than 27 different ones, and clear rules. And these rules should prepare then the playground in which AI can be used and flourished. And the key word for us is therefore this AI should be trustworthy. European citizens, undertakings, consumers should be able to rely on the AI which is offered and used and deployed in Europe. And that, in our view, will help the technology. Because we believe that in Europe, with our tradition and our, our values, we will only have uh, a real use of this technology if people trust this and uptake it. We will otherwise, if we have scandals, if we have problems with AI, and this is not completely unknown, look um, at the Netherlands, they have already experiences when one government had to step back because the social welfare system relied on a um, on an, uh, software application which didn't pr function properly. This can have huge repercussions and will, would have as well repercussions for the whole technology interpretation. So what we did is we tried to think about risk. Uh, we tried to think about what is really risky and what needs regulation and on the other hand what is not risky, which is as well a good message because if something is not risky it should not be regulated or only regulated to an extent which is absolutely needed in the minimum sense. So we have a risk-based approach for those AI systems which we identify as being high risk because they put your life in danger like in an autonomous car or they put they, they take the, the AI may take important decisions for your uh, future because it's selecting recruitment files, you're not invited because you have the wrong postal code. All these things we don't want to see. For these things we think it's high risk and therefore we have some requirements to check this mainly five, data, human oversight, uh, there should be documentation, um, there should be robust, it should be cyber secure, and so on. So this must be checked, and then the product is AI, should be fine when it hits the market. So far, we have, an, we have two annexes for products, basically AI based in products, and AI as self-standing system. Cultural applications are not really on this list, because as far as we stand, we don't see that there, these are essential decisions for you. They are important. That doesn't mean it's not important. But here it's about which level of risk do they display. It's not about what is important for you because I don't want to quote even after the holidays the old Schumann saying uh, with the culture and Europe. Culture is of course very important but it's not so risky. What we have and this of course may play a certain, a certain role is we have for all AI systems we have some targeted um, obligations. We have some, um, we always speak about this pyramid so we start with the pyramid at the top. We have some prohibitions, which are limited uh, but important in our view because we have certain behaviors we think we don't want to see in, in Europe, and this is um, subliminal manipulation, uh, which is, it leads to physical or psychological harm, exploitation of people who are vulnerable as well. This is, I think, something unacceptable, and we don't want to see it, and then I think it would not be to the benefit of the technology. If you would start to use minors, or you would try to create addictiveness in, 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 papi, uh, in particular with a view to people who cannot really judge the situation, that would certainly not be to the, be to the benefit of the technology. Then we have that that's important for you, for this context, public social scoring and uh, facial recognition by law enforcement authorities. So this is a set of prohibitions, limited but important. And then we have, this was already mentioned, we have some transparency obligations um, where we think that's important that people are informed. 
And this is for us as well, and as I may say, is the result of our public consultation. Because we had a public consultation where we asked uh, all Europeans, all those who wanted to reply, and we got more than 1,200. And a lot represented huge groups like consumer organizations, business organizations, and others, but as well individuals, academia. And a lot of replies were, we want to know if we talk to a chatbot. We want to know if we're interacting with an AI system. So this is what one of the elements we put there in Article 52. You should be informed if you interact with an AI. The same holds too. You should be informed if you, uh, your emotions are captured and analyzed. We allow this. It can be done. Uh, it may be high risk if it's used in a particular sensitive situation like in your recruitment interview, but that's a different story because then it's recruitment and recruitment is high risk, not emotional recognition as such. But you should be informed. Biometric categorization is another one. Um, the most relevant probably for your context are the deep fakes. And the deep fakes, we have seen this all in the debates in the last years, are really a problem for our democracy and for our discussion culture, for our possibility to have a, an open and transparent and meaningful debate among ourselves, what we want to do, how we want to decide. If we cannot rely on what we see and what we hear, it starts to become difficult to make a judgment. And therefore, we think that you should inform if you use a deep fake so that uh, at least you can, you can see this, you can understand that what, what you see as a content is not, um, is not natural, is not original, but has been reconstructed synthetically. We in the original Commission proposal have added ex explicitly the exception for artistic freedom and expression. Now you may have heard the latest compromise proposal has taken that out because they felt it goes too far, so that we will see this debate will continue. There certainly, uh, <coughs> uh, there certainly will be this discussion. In any case, in our view, of course, if in a James Bond movie, and, uh, which I once saw, the, J the car flies over the river, uh, yes, you don't need now to put into a subtitle, this is a deep fake, because this is obvious from the situation. And uh, even if you all, perhaps some of us want last sometimes to be like James Bond, we know that it is not for real. So I think it's, uh, we need as well to have here a bit of a dose of reasonableness, because in a lot of contexts, it's clear from the context that uh, something is a deep fake. But if you should put up in a news show a film, and this film is, for instance, uh, uh, to entertain, this should be indicated that this is just for, to entertain, and this is not a real person. I think that uh, follows from, should follow from our regulation and probably would as well be um, a violation of personality rights. This is, in a nutshell, what we want to do. We are in a decisive period. That's why we are, it's very good that we discuss today, because um, we will uh, hopefully come to a general approach in the European Council until the end of the year. This is at least our political objective. The European Parliament, that Axel can explain much better than me where they stand, but they work as well with highest possible speed on the, um, on the proposal, and we hope that we then will enter soon uh, in the next year in the, in the trilogues, so that we, because it's for us really a key part of this digital legislation. And we have, I think, as a commission in this mandate, presented a number of acts like the DSA, the DMA, uh, we had the, the Data Act, we had uh, <coughs> a number of things which really are like foundational laws for the digital area. And I think the AI Act is one of these acts. And it would be really a pity if this important stone would be missing in that building. So we will hope that we will be able to still manage this with our co-legislators under this mandate. Thanks a lot. So thank you, um, Maria Rosa. And uh, thanks to all our panelists and especially also to Sabine. It's always a pleasure um, to have you around. Um, so if we are looking to the proposal, and uh, I think the headline for all of these is at the end, where is the right balance? And in every of these, what you have described today in your businesses, um, you might be affected, you don't know sometimes really, but probably there's the exception of the exception of the exception, what we have probably somehow to define or to tackle or whatever. So um, therefore differentiation might be a kind of a yeah, important instrument at the end um, to come forward with these um, exercises. Um, so if, if we are just looking and in, in saying, oh yes, it's a high risk AI system in every critical infrastructure and so on, and you're considering a kind of a space agency as a critical infrastructure and all of a sudden you have a kind of a Coke machine there with an AI system on board, 
then you wouldn't consider this as an AI high-risk system. But uh, then again, we have to differentiate. Uh, we, we know you have to use AI for your services, for your competition, and that's why a kind of a risk-based approach, what was mentioned already, and um, the OECD definition, what makes you probably not um, only um, yeah, mitigating this on an EU level, it, it makes you more international, and this might be also considered um, what is an AI high-risk system at the end. We need clarity. This was also mentioned and uh, desired, of course, I know. Um, the way of a European legislator, the Commission is doing the proposal, the Parliament is complicating all the things, the Council is um, yeah, getting back probably what the exaggeration of the Parliament is, and then we are ending with the proposal of the Commission. Um, and this takes years, and um, so I hope that we might find the right balance here. Um, the problem what we are facing, from my point of view, are always ideological approaches. And uh, so the Commission and the intention has been quite good in saying, oh, this is a product regulation. But in the Parliament, I would say we have more and more colleagues around who are looking at this as a consumer protection law. And this creates a lot of problems. And therefore, um, I would recommend to the com uh, Commission at the end, you have to be self-confident at the end. If we are doing this not right, you should not... Um, Restrain yourself in saying, then we are withdrawing. Sometimes without a regulation, it might be better instead of having a bad one. And, um, and I, I don't know if we are coming to this point, but um, I am considering AI as a booster for the digitalization. And if we are not doing this right, the next step of development, the next step of wealth and whatever, might not take place in Europe. And uh, this is what I'm fearing, and um, therefore we need to have a real close look to all what we are doing here right now. If, once again, if we are not doing this right, we are out. Um, this is my approach to this, and that's why um, for me it seems a little bit serious. And the what I would say, and it was mentioned tonight also, or this afternoon, <coughs> the experience from the GDPR, we shouldn't do this again. Um, to overregulate, to have a lot of bureaucracy, to have um, uh, articles in place, nobody will understand except uh, lawyer. And, um, and once again, also the interpretation of these so far did not lead to a kind of a full harmonization situation in Europe. And this is what we are intending to have one set of rules with the same interpretation throughout the EU. And this is what is important uh, to all of us. And um, again, then we should have also people on board if we are thinking on AI board and, and uh, something like this, so expert rounds that they are not focusing on one single element um, because this is then not broad enough in, in approaching all these. So at least, um, of course, we have to um, focus also on the freedom of arts, the freedom of expression, and of course here we can differentiate what was mentioned also about deep fakes. And um, so also I guess we can happy that this regulation is only affecting the digital world and not the real world. Otherwise, I would uh, see a kind of a Santa Claus or um, Father Christmas with the transparent um, information on it. This is a deep fake. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what we do not want, of course. And um, so 
we have to be aware that unintended consequences at the end, even if we have once finished these, we need to have a flexible legislator who can react immediately and not after years. So this would be also something what I would have in mind um, regarding facial recognition and predictive uh, policing. Yeah, probably it's necessary, uh, necessary to mention, but I'm asking myself for law enforcement issues why we do not have here the similar structure like in the GDPR where we have the civil element and then the law enforcement element would have been probably better instead of having now this discussion and the confusion about um, official recognition. But um, at the end, I hope and let's cross fingers also with the European legislator, let us do this right, finding the right balance and please help us with this. And uh, so if I may, so have a wonderful evening, good talks and thanks once again also to the EIF. Thanks.